Yo, what's going on? Pope Nickel back with another video, and today we got a very special video. Hope your day is going well, night's going well, whenever you clicked on the video. On the Pope Nickel channel, we've reacted to a lot of different types of rock stars on this channel. People like Led Zeppelin, The Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, John Anderson. The list goes on and on. There's a lot of people I've reacted to. I've reacted to a lot of videos. I've reacted to a lot of quote-unquote rock stars. There's a lot of interesting people out there. Musicians. People of other creatives. There's a lot of different people out there. Today, I'm going to be looking at the scariest rock star of all time. Gigi Allen. And um, there's a lot of very interesting videos that popped up when I typed in this dude's name. But um, this right here looks like somebody has a little mini documentary on him. But I, I mean, it seems interesting to check out. So why not? Let's check it out. Uh, scariest rock star of all time. Let's see what he was, uh, how far off the rails he went. It's 19 minutes. Ooh. Movie time. Movie reaction. Yeah. Press like. Now, do you, okay, do you honestly believe yes. that you're a charismatic figure? I believe that I am the king. I am the messiah. I rule the rock and roll and on the God. I'm bringing us to a revolution against the government, against the police, against any form of society that is trying to put us down and restrict us in any way, shape, or manner. You cannot conform. <laughs> Morbid musicians. Okay. Although he was in a genre and era that was wrapped in controversy on a consistent basis, Gigi Allen was on a different level entirely. His antics, opinions, and music made him one of the most controversial and talked about figures in the punk scene during the 80s and early 90s. And today, over 25 years after his death, Allen is still talked about constantly in the world of music. Everything about his life, his upbringing, and his artistry was bizarre. He was described as a genius by some and a complete degenerate by others. Some people idolized him, some people hated him, but during his short time on this earth, nobody could take their eyes off of G.G. Allen. Hmm. The earliest indication that Allen's upbringing was far from normal comes from his name. He was born Jesus Christ Allen on the 26th of August, 1956 in New Hampshire. That name what? alone should tell you that his parents were some strange individuals, specifically his father, Merle Allen, who stated that Jesus had visited him and told him that his new son would be similar to the Messiah, thus giving him the name. This insane childhood would help form Gigi into the man he would soon become, and it is a pivotal part of the story. The best way to tell you about Alan's childhood and his erratic father is in his own words. He wrote a 1200 word essay titled The First 10 Years that details his strange upbringing and gives us insight into how hard his life was as a kid. The first five years of my life were infested with sickness and violence. It consisted of living in a log cabin in the northern woods of New Hampshire with father, mother, and brother. It was an extremely real, primitive, antisocial existence with no running water, little heat, and unbearably claustrophobic. We boiled water, laundered, and would bathe in a very tiny, chipped sink. I was immensely sick with asthma, always fighting to breathe amidst emotionally uncomfortable conditions with a cabin where the wall colors were that of the ever peeling paint strips. We lived in darkness. Father hated life. He also didn't care much for the company of other people. The surrounding air was suffocated in destruction. We were more like prisoners than a family. We were prisoners to father, and father was a prisoner of himself. Wow. From this essay, you can tell that his father made his family's life hell, and his mother, Arletta Gunther, was getting increasingly worried that he was going to do something drastic to either Gigi or his older brother, who was also named Merle. This led to her taking her two sons and fleeing the log cabin while her husband was at work. 
Arleta would take them from a dire situation to a slightly less dire situation. Gigi claimed that she was attracted to a certain type of guy and that these men would often make their lives difficult, but it was at least better than the insane life they had before their father. Gigi's mother would have his name legally changed from Jesus to Kevin and had him and his brother enrolled in a high school in Vermont. During their time in high school in the 1960s, Gigi and his brother Merle would get up to all sorts of trouble that would foreshadow their chaotic music careers. Alan said in an interview that their childhood was very chaotic, full of chances and dangers. We sold drugs, stole, broke into houses, cars, did whatever we wanted to for the most part, including all the bands we played in. People even hated us back then. While this was happening, Alan was being inspired by bands like The Beatles, The New York Dolls, Alice Cooper, The Dave Clark Five, and The Ramones. Merle and Gigi would continue their illegal antics for the duration of the 60s and most of the 70s, but these influences would lead them to creating a number of short-lived bands that would create the blueprint for Gigi Allen's music and image. Hmm. Gigi Allen's discography is a vast, poorly produced mess with a lot of great hidden gems filled with interesting songs and a lot of duds that are essentially non-starters. It would take hours to properly cover in detail the amount of music this man has made, but the first few bands he was a part of is an essential part of his history. In the mid-teens, Alan formed the band Little Sister's Date with his brother, and the band primarily covered rock songs at the time. This wouldn't last long, however, as the pair would gradually transition their interest into punk, and their music would reflect that. Little Sister's Date lasted around a year and was one of his many short-lived projects. Other brief bands included Malpractice and Strip Search, and it's evidence that his chaotic behavior and nature was the driving force behind these bands falling apart. However, his work with the band The Jabbers was arguably the most important part of Alan becoming who he was. He was with them Jabber. from 1977 to 1984, and in those six and a half years, Gigi Allen and The Jabbers would release some interesting music, especially the band's first album, titled Always Was, Is, and Always Shall Be. This album, released in 1980, was an 11-track project that was less than 30 minutes in length, but there were a lot of interesting notes to take from it. Alan's voice sounded much healthier than what we're used to. The songs were a lot slower, and there were elements of pop in some of the tracks. Of course, the lyrics were at times controversial and bizarre, but this was nothing in comparison to what he would go on to do in the world of music. In fact, this is one of the only times where it seems like Gigi was genuinely trying to appeal to some kind of a market or audience. In his later years, Alan would challenge and fight his audience in many different ways, whether it be by literally trying to fight them or challenging them with his controversial opinions or hard to swallow music. But this little Gigi, who was clearly very inspired by New York Dolls, seemed to actually care about how his music was received, how good it sounded, and how many people were listening. Unfortunately, despite some of the album's promising moments, it essentially came and went. This may have lit a bitter spark under Alan as his antics got progressively crazier from here, and by April of 1984, Gigi Allen and the Jabbers were no more. It was a surprisingly good run, and strangely, even though Alan would go on to garner a large Jabbers. fan base and a nationally known controversial image, this was the best his music would ever sound from a technical standpoint. The quality wow. never increased after this, and some critics and fans would say that that was for the best, while others would say that it was an example of his squandered potential. Either way, Alan was on his way to some strange and bizarre times, and he was gonna get there with or without the music. So he squandered his good sound? Wasn't that good? WCPX TV Orlando. Michelle Morrow with tonight's news. Meteorologist Pamela Kister. And Mike Storms with sports. This is News Night 6. Looks pretty tame tonight, <laughs> but what happened here last night would make most of us sick. 
Hello everyone, thanks for joining News Night 6. The club owner says it happens in big cities everywhere. Last night it happened in Orlando, something you would never expect to see in public. And in the end, two men arrested on charges almost beyond belief. News Night 6 reporter Shepard Smith joins us live outside the club's Space Fish on Church Street with this exclusive report. Michelle, we must warn, what you are about to see and hear is quite graphic, but it's true. Happened at the club Space Fish behind me last night. A band called Gigi Allen and the Murder Junkies performing at a club that prides itself, in its words, on having shows on the cutting edge. People paid $7 to watch a man defecate into his own hand while he was nude. And that is just the beginning. The Jabbers may have oh. disbanded, but Allen was more no. active in the music scene than ever before. His antics were becoming increasingly extreme, and his drug habits were becoming intense. These probably went hand in hand, and helped to create a strangely defining moment in his career. Oh. In 1985, at a show in Illinois, Allen took a number of laxatives, and during his performance, he defecated on stage. The crowd had dwindled from around 125 to 20 at this point, but that small audience were shocked, and started running for the door as quickly as they could. The owners and security tried to stop him, but unsurprisingly, nobody wanted to go near the shit-covered psychopath who was now throwing his excrement around at every poor attendee he could reach. Alan and his bandmate fled the scene, but were later arrested. Surely, this was a once-off, based on the crowd reaction, the arrest, and the damaging impact on Gigi's career. But no, this was only the beginning. Gigi seemed to love this reaction, and if anything, he wanted more. This was the first time he did something like this, but he would go on to do it many more times all over the country. His antics got more extreme, his drug habits got more intense, and the character of Gigi Allen was in full effect. The world was about to be informally introduced to punk's most insane icon. After this show, Allen recorded some music with another band, the Texas Nazis. At this point, his music was more intense, counterculture, and sounded nothing like the music he made five years ago. It was a stark contrast and a great representation for where Gigi was in his bizarre career. Wow. Wow. In 1989, Gigi Allen was arrested for assault on a female friend of his, and he was sent to prison where he stayed from December 25th, 1989 to March 16th, 1991. A lot happened in this period of time. For one, Gigi Allen and the Murder Junkies was formed, which would go on to be the most successful and discussed band Allen was ever a part of. He also wrote the Gigi Allen Manifesto while in prison, a mission statement of sorts that detailed Allen's opinions on the music world, the political climate in America, and the reasoning behind his non-conformist nature. In the manifesto, he writes, if you believe in the real underground of rock and roll, then now is the time to do something about it. The time is now to overthrow the current situations and declare war on the record companies, radio stations, publications, and anyone who promotes the whole so-called scene as it now stands. We need to destroy it all and take it back from the corporate phonies and conformists. But action must be taken now and blood must be spilled. It was obvious that Gigi had a clearer vision of what he wanted to achieve and how he wanted to achieve it. When he was eventually okay. released from prison, he broke the terms of his parole almost immediately and went on tour with his newly formed band. It was around this time that a young and ambitious filmmaker showed interest in creating a documentary about Gigi. This filmmaker was Todd Phillips. He went on a tour with the band and filmed some of the most bizarre Gigi Allen moments ever caught on tape. It showed the depraved side of him, and a slightly different side, an articulate, calmer, more sober Gigi who somewhat reflected on his actions and, at least in his own mind, justified his behavior. It was probably the best piece ever made about Alan, and it's not surprising that Todd Phillips will become as successful as he became. Ironically, his highest grossing movie was about another depraved lunatic who hated society, but I digress. Oh. At this stage, Gigi Allen was a notorious and arguably famous or infamous musician. He was selling out shows, creating headlines everywhere he went, and he ended up on various different talk shows to discuss his antics, such as Geraldo and The Jerry Springer Show. In 1993, Allen appeared on The Jane Whitney Show in a now famous interview. This would, unfortunately, be Gigi's final interview on television, because in that same month, he would die.
Jeez. Death. Uh, what's your ultimate idea of a, of a performance, of a fantasy performance? All of, it's not a fantasy performance, Jane. Come on, everything I do is real. It comes out of my head. Well, what's your I live this life every day. When I'm on stage, it's my therapy. It's not a performance, it's a ritual. And the ultimate performance would be when I have reached my peak, and I'm not there yet, so don't you all clap when I say this. I'll commit suicide, but I'll take your kids with me. When you reach your peak, it's time to die. And when do you think your peak's going to be? Whenever the battle is over, yeah. whenever you have lost the power to fight. When you have got the power to fight, you fight. When you lose the power, you kill yourself or I'll kill you. Are you a happy person? I'm beautiful. Gigi always claimed that he was going to take his own life on stage, in an ultimate act of defiance and performance. But this did not happen. Maybe it could have happened if he lived a little bit longer, but on the 28th of June, 1993, Gigi Allen died after performing in Manhattan. The show was pretty normal by Gigi Allen standards. He performed one song, and during the second track, the venue cut the power in an attempt to stop Allen from performing. He trashed the club, defecated on stage, and fought the audience members, until eventually going outside and walking aimlessly around the streets of Manhattan. A small number of his audience followed his reckless path as he tried and failed to get a cab a number of times and walked around for around an hour, until eventually getting to his friend Johnny Puke's apartment. At the apartment, Gigi, his bandmates, and some of his fans partied for hours, and during this time, Alan took a large amount of heroin and accidentally overdosed. Later, somebody called an ambulance, but it was too late. Gigi was pronounced dead at the scene. He was 36 years old. It was over. Gigi's insane life had come to an end, but the party didn't stop there. At his funeral, the mortician was asked to leave Alan's corpse the way it was, decomposing and rotting, as his friends partied around his body, taking drugs, posing with the corpse, and blasting his music. Gigi was buried with a bottle of Jim Beam and headphones that played The Suicide Sessions, an album that Gigi Allen had made four years prior. It was a strange but morbidly fitting way for Gigi to go. Allen would only become more famous because of this, and although he wasn't as big as some of his contemporaries, his success was nothing short of a phenomenon. A drug addicted, somewhat confused, self-proclaimed degenerate had etched his way into the Punk Hall of Fame, and he probably didn't even want to be there. His life may have ended, but his legacy would be discussed for decades in a comical but almost respectable fashion. Regardless of what you think, by the time he died, he had left his footprint on the music world. Conclusion? I thought the death was the conclusion. Well, I'm so impressed. The you cover so of the fun. new record. Have you heard the cover of his new record? I know. Yeah. It's him in a casket and the band standing around the casket like... <laughs> I swear to God. Gigi still sings. <laughs> Gigi lives. Did you ever see Gigi? Gigi did you see Gigi live? No, I was just too afraid. It was an amazing experience. No, I just, I could have went one time. I know he knew he was playing, but I just didn't get around to it. There is so much that I didn't get to talk about when it comes to this man. Like his insanely large discography of music that spanned two decades and consisted of over 30 albums and over a dozen bands. Like the fact that he had contact with Johnny Cash, or that celebrities and performers like Kurt Cobain, Hank Williams III, Lil Luzi Vert, Eric Andre and hundreds of other entertainers would talk about him in both a positive and negative life. Or even the fact that he had a strange relationship with serial killer John Wayne Gacy, who he would write to and visit on a number of occasions. Gacy even admitted being a fan of Alan and painted the artwork for one of his albums. These facts and anecdotes are just footnotes in Alan's insane career and it goes to show how much he did in his short life. Given the circumstances he grew up in, the abuse he went through, and the lack of resources he had, it is impressive at what he managed to achieve. It doesn't justify his actions, but it helps to give an insight into such a strange and bizarre character. On the one hand, people viewed him as a violent, antagonistic degenerate with squandered potential who actively made poor decisions on a consistent basis. On the other hand, he was a passionate musician, a talented writer, and an articulate but misunderstood man. But you can boil it down whatever way you want. Love him, hate him, praise him, or scold him. The reality is, he probably wouldn't have cared either way. 
you know, when my time comes, and, and, and like I said, if you accelerate death, then you, if you seek death, you accelerate life, which is actually true, because you're living so fast and you're putting so much time, so much, so many years in such a little bit of time, that if I was to die tomorrow, I probably still live more years than, than most people do anyway, so that's the way I choose to do it. Like I said, you lay down the, 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 the road work, you, you sit down, you say whatever you gotta say, you make your purpose known, and then you leave. And that is it for the second oh. episode of Morbid Musicians. Thank you very much for watching. Okay, so shout out to that guy for uh, putting that video together, obviously. What is he just like? Is this, he's just a, a product of his environment. He, he grew up in a, in a really, really extremely horrible situation, it looks like. And he just looks like from an early age, just lost his mind. Um, now, everybody looks up to him. I mean, the show probably just got so bizarre that people just wanted to see what he would do next, you know. But he obviously, he, he had a message. There's a message in there somewhere. He obviously, he says what a lot of people say today um, about record labels and how, you know, it's all about money. Everything's about money today. It's all about money. Nobody cares about artist development or, you know, the actual music. You know, the authenticity of the music is all about what's going to get the most clicks and, uh, and clickbait stuff up. I think that that's pretty much at the core of it, but, you know, drugs plays a lot into it, and, you know, just his upbringing, obviously, he did not have the greatest um, upbringing, but, um, extremely, extremely interesting, uh, little documentary that they had there, um, scariest rock star of all time, do you guys know anybody that's, Maybe has a crazier story than that. I did react to the uh, the the legend that sold his soul to the devil. I don't. That's not as crazy as this though. Like this guy had ties to to a serial killer, what? and wrote to him, and had the serial killer paint one of his albums. And that's probably not even the craziest thing about the dude. Like the guy said, he he, he could go on and on about him. And he lived till 36. There are so many people that are part of that uh, 27 club that didn't do all of this, but could have. If they lived a little bit longer, could have. And maybe turned it around. But, uh, geez. Yeah, that's the intro. That's the wild story right there. That's the wild story. But, uh, hey, we'll be back with more reactions. If you made this far, this far, I'll be back with another video. Like and subscribe if you're new. Know.